Well, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to the Circa Special ADSS Seminar. We are uh, very fortunate to have a very uh, popular and uh, great scientist from the USA. And for your information, this uh, undertaking, an outreach in the Philippines, is a collaboration between different agencies, uh, Circa Biotech Information Center, the National Corn uh, Competitive Board. We also have uh, as co-organizer, the Plowshares Incorporated, and uh, ISA and APSP2, as well as the U.S. Mission through the USDA, USAID, and FAS. So before we proceed with the, prop, with the, uh, with the seminar proper, may I request uh, uh, Mr. Philip Schull, the Agricultural Counselor of USDA, to give an overview, a short overview on the biotech outreach here in the Philippines. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's, thank you all for coming out today. Really, what I, what I really wanted to do was just uh, to remind everyone of the importance of seminars like this and to once again, uh, this, this kind of program is just one more celebration of the, of the tremendous relationship the Philippines and the United States has in, in agriculture. Um, as I was saying to Dr. Parrott this morning, uh, I, one of the reasons I love being in the Philippines so much is that we have what I like to call a model agricultural relationship. Uh, we are the number one supplier of food and agricultural products to the Philippines, but we are also the Philippines' number one market for its exports of food and agricultural products. In fact, in 2012, the United States took about 30% of Philippine uh, food and agricultural exports. And um, this, uh, this wonderful relationship is, is, uh, it will continue uh, well into the future. And uh, it's, it's such a, a tremendous uh, development, and I'm so happy to be here and be part of it. Um, again, your, I, and I think there is no more urgent issue that we have when we talk about the food security of uh, the world than in this topic of biotechnology. Um, I had the privilege of uh, hearing Dr. Parrott speak for the first time back in about 2001 in, um, when I, I was in Argentina and I, I went up to uh, Peru and heard him speak there. We were working on that and, and he was able to put it together in such a way. I see a number of eminent scientists in this room. How many of you are scientists here? Are working? Yes. Very good. Um, as you know so well, one of the greatest challenges for scientists is to be able to explain to us lay people and communicate effectively uh, uh, the wonder uh, and majesty of, of science and make those complex things uh, easy to understand for the public. And uh, Dr. Parrott is a, a master of that. When I first learned that I had to help market something from the United States called genetically modified organisms, I said, oh no, that's, that's going to be very difficult. Um, but then the more I learned, the more I talked to sincere scientists who were interested in, in feeding the rest of the world, um, I became, okay, well if they believe in it, then, then, then I want to believe in it too. And the more I learned, the, the better it became. And, and Dr. Parrott was, his presentation really helped put it together for me. And so um, uh, we're so glad to be able to have him back again to the Philippines to help explain this uh, issue that is so important and is what has allowed us to postpone that Malthusian nightmare of not enough people, not enough food for all the people uh, that are, that are in, in our world now. So with that, I just wish, uh, thank you very much always for Circa, the wonderful partnership we have. And um, uh, Wayne, I do, you then uh, we will have uh, Dr. Parrott introduced now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Phil. 
So now I will introduce our uh, speaker. Dr. Wayne Parrott has a degree in agronomy from the University of Kentucky and MS and PhD degrees in plant breeding and plant genetics from the University of Wisconsin. He is currently a professor of crop science at the University of Georgia, where he has been for the past 23 years. He conducts research on the development and deployment of transgenic crop plants. One major research trust is the development of soybeans resistant to insects, nematodes, and fungi, as well as modifying soy soybean for novel feed uses. Dr. Parrot has published over 80 journal articles in refereed publications, along with 12 book chapters and three patents. These are still quite a few, Dr. Parrot. I think you still need to publish more. <laughs> Just a joke. Dr. Parrot is actively engaged in training graduate students and postdoc fellows and teaches graduate level courses in genetics and undergraduate courses in agroecology and sustainable agriculture. He has traveled extensively throughout uh, Latin America and worked closely with le legislators and regulators in the various countries with their legal and regulatory issues relating to biotechnology. Dr. Parrot also is the scientific advisor to the Biotechnology Committee of the International Life Sciences Institute, which serves to bring the best science available to help formulate regulatory policies. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's all welcome Dr. Wayne Parrot. Good morning, and thank you for that uh, welcome and for that introduction. It's always, uh, for me, it's always a privilege to talk about a topic that I'm really passionate about. And that's the role of agricultural biotechnology in development. I understand that I'm speaking to a mixed audience with varying levels of technical expertise, so the topic of today is more of a, a type of message that can be delivered to general audiences as opposed to giving a formal research uh, seminar. So when we started talking about uh, biotechnology or more specifically GMOs, it's been a controversial topic since the beginning. And those that have heard me talk before know that I like to start with a cover of Greenpeace magazine. Because way back to 1999, and they're trying to tell us that we have dangerous technologies there. So dangerous a guy has to use his uh, gown and goggles and mask and forgot gloves. <laughs> so from the beginning, we have not had an honest message. Okay. Um, when I am at the, uh, on campus though, I, do, I have uh, 25 years of research on genetic engineering, the use of engineered crops, uh, how to make them, how to use them. But my teaching is actually uh, in a campus that we have in Central America, and it's agroecology. And I've been told by many people that agroecology and sustainable and uh, agriculture and genetic engineering are mutually exclusive. And I'm here to argue just the opposite. Agroecology and just, uh, a knowledge of the principles behind agroecology inform us as to what are the traits we need to be working on. And the traits we can achieve with engineering really help uh, and make it easier to implement sustainable agricultural systems. I was originally born right about here and grew up in this region. And to this day, my main area of uh, work is uh, in Latin America when it comes to biotech uh, regu regulations and uh, outreach. So one of the really neat things about being in the Philippines of all the Southeastern Asian countries, it reminds me of home the most. Uh, culturally and with the vegetation and uh, the landscape. One of the projects that we have, and this is we were able to actually coordinate all the environmental risk assessors from the continent, and we wrote a guide for environmental risk assessment of GMOs. 
it was tailor-made for the Latin American reality. You know, a lot of the stuff Europe sends out is, is just uh, not applicable. Uh, and as, in Spanish, because mo that's what most of our regulators speak. And we have a version in Portuguese uh, as well. And on top of that, uh, I have done a lot of work on the food and feed safety assessment of uh, GMOs, which are all in refereed publications. But I'd like to start off then with the topic of genetic modification and what it is. It's, it's something old, very old. And this is a picture I put together many years ago. Because it's been pointed out that the crops that we all use have been so modified that it takes a very well-trained botanist to be able to identify the wild relatives of our crops, what our crops looked like before people got in to modify them. So if you, for those who haven't seen this picture before, what are you looking at? You're, you're, you're very familiar with these crops. Somebody? Speak up, I can't hear. essence of genetic modification. And just remember that it is impossible, you know, barring minor differences with epigenetics, it's impossible to change the uh, way a crop looks without changing the DNA underneath it. And, and uh, we're just now understanding these changes uh, with the, now that we can sequence genomes, but the point is that we have been changing DNA for many centuries, even though people didn't realize what they were doing at the time. And today, you know, in the past century, genetic modification became a science. It became just the science of plant breeding. And because of that, all our crops are, there's just a tremendous amount of diversity in, in the way they grow, in the way they behave, the color, the taste, and just about any trait you want to uh, think about. And on top of that, you know, not only do we breed for quality and yield, pest resistance is a particularly major problem. This happens to be a soybean leaf from one of our research plots. And one of the graduate students just, you know, was amazed. And he came over and said, just realize that this one little section, you take a close look, you've got one insect and uh, three different diseases. And that's what farmers face in the field every day. Now, most farmers I know rather harvest soybean than harvest mold or insects, so they have two choices. They can use chemicals, or they can go to a breeder and ask breeders to develop resistant lines. So, what a breeder will do is many times they go to the wild relatives. Again, this happens to be a row of soybean, and uh, this is one of the wild soybeans, and again, you can see uh, what it really looked like before it was modified. And the problem in this case is it's susceptible, in this case it's frog eye leaf spot. The necessary genes for resistance are coming from the uh, donor here, this, this wild uh, soybean. It is the job of the breeder to uh, cross the two of them together and then spend about 10 years sorting out the bad traits that they don't want for agriculture, the bindiness, the small seeds and whatnot, until he's got all the high quality plus the one uh, gene for resistance from the donor. And this has been our bread and butter. This has sustained our agriculture for the past century. The problem starts to come in when there is no resistance in the wild relatives, or the trait you need is not in the wild relatives, at which point they start resorting to genetic engineering. The classic example would be these papayas. Uh, they look very, very bad because they're infected with the virus, the papaya ring spot virus, which is undergoing, it's an epidemic around the world. These happen to be in Thailand. So in a laboratory like mine, or like many laboratories here in the Philippines, we can start cell lines and culture. 
And then from the cell lines, uh, we add the DNA to them. Uh, DNA from just about anywhere. In this particular case, what we need is resistance. Resistance to the virus. Uh, it's cultured, we, you know, we add hormones to the, to the culture plate to make the callus grow, and by changing the types of hormones, we get the cells to give us small plants, which become big plants. And the only difference then between here and there is one gene for resistance. So that's the whole premise behind uh, genetic engineering. So, what is genetic modification? For an agronomist and a plant breeder like me, going from the wild relative to the, to the cultivated form, and coming up with all the variability of, that I showed you in the photographing, this process of crossing in desired traits is, is modification. In the, in the more modern meaning, the way the media, the press, and people use it and think about it, they're really referring to genetic engineering. Other people call it biotechnology. Some people call it transgenic. Or the coin of the realm is GMO. And a lot of the legal documents have the word GMO in it for genetically modified organism. So to put things in perspective, biotechnology is a huge field. It goes across agriculture. It goes across medicine. It goes across uh, food science and preparation. And it's just within it, a biotech, we have a much smaller group of technologies that fall under genetic modification. And under genetic modification, we have an even smaller group that falls under uh, engineering or GMOs. So the focus of my talk is specifically about the GMO category. So within GMOs, again, we have many things, uh, like vitamin supplements, insulin and other pharmaceuticals, some of the more modern vaccines, uh, they're all the products made with GMO organisms. Most, in this day and age, most uh, beers and wines are made with GMO yeasts. Cheese, the enzyme in practically other cheese around the world comes from uh, GMO organisms. Artificial sweeteners tend to be a uh, GMO. And all of these are used all over the world, and they're never a cause for concern anywhere. It's only when we get to the GMO crops that people start to worry. And even though, you know, there's not, I don't really see any big difference between the two categories. But my topic for the rest of the day is specifically the GMO crops. So I'm sure all of you have seen a version of this um, map before. And it is in, 19, in uh, last year, uh, the GMOs were legally planted in these countries that are in the darker green. It includes the most, most of the Western Hemisphere and uh, key parts in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. It's less common in uh, Europe and less common in Africa. So we started planting GMOs in um, 2004 even though the records really didn't start until about 2006. And when you look at the adoption of these, in, in uh, just 17 years, it's gone all the way up to over 170 million hectares. And on top of that, it, that really makes it the fastest adopted technology in the history of agriculture. The reason this is significant is because if you add up all the land area over the 17 years, we have a billion hectares of experience with GMOs. We have experience of 17 years, a billion hectares, over 17 million farmers, and about some 30 countries around the world. Which means that when people ask questions about GMOs or express concerns about GMOs, we can actually answer them on, based on experience, on a real world experience. We don't need to be guessing and we don't need to be speculating about it. We've got the data to answer the questions. Also, to give you a sense of comparison, uh, this is the growth of the organic industry. The organic industry is probably the second fastest growing sector of agriculture. And by comparison, it really lags behind the uh, GM agriculture. 
So, one of the big limitations that we have is that there's some um, 160 countries on Earth, and that they're only legal in about 30, which leaves a large section of the population that has no access to GMOs, so they can't experience them firsthand. And even for the countries where they are legal, uh, most of the, you know, there's about half of the population is in cities now. They don't get out to the country, so they really have never seen a GMO in person, and they really don't know what they're talking about. So what I have done here is taken some of the GMOs that are either commercialized or in the pipeline and divided them in two categories. The category that's coming from the, um, the private sector and then the category that's coming from the public sector. And this is one of them. So the, uh, you know, not everything has to be about food. The, uh, these are uh, novel color flowers. They're made by a company in Australia. They're grown in South America, and they're shipped to Europe and Japan. And the, in Japan particularly, I was talking with the CEO of the company, in Japan, each of these roses brings somewhere between 20 and 30 US dollars. So you can tell it's a wonderful business uh, for them. Now, they also ship them to Europe. The only the issue is that if you want to ship them to Europe, you have to label them as not for human consumption, just in case anybody was wondering. But uh, closer to home, uh, you know, where I live in the U.S., uh, we do grow fresh vegetables. We have a window of time, you know, as the spring comes in, they start in the very south of the U.S. and plant further in it further north as the summer progresses. These are our squash plants. Uh, again, you can see the impact of viruses on the squash, and you can see the uh, GM version. One of the issues was that the, infect, the virus that infects the plants also really damages the fruit. And how many of you would eat these? Raise your hand. See, and the thing is, the irony is they're actually safe to eat. They just don't look good. But uh, there was a lot of waste. You know, a lot of it had to be thrown out because people like you refused to eat them. So now, with the engineered versions, about 90% of the crop is harvestable. Of course, you can see the varieties are sold with this really imposing names. Justice, Conqueror, <laughs> Liberator. So, judgment. The giveaway that their GMO is this three underneath it. That's in the number of virus resistances that are in, <coughs> into it. Another category, though, is uh, herbicide tolerance. The idea is to simplify application of herbicides. This is a photo in Paraguay in South America, which is a demonstration plot showing what happens to, uh, this is soybean, if herbicides are, are not applied. The yield in this half of the plot is going to be probably half of what the yield is on that half, and that's simply due to loss from weeds. Uh, here's another one. This happens to be uh, rice with uh, herbicide tolerance in it. Uh, here you have a mixture of rice and red rice, and you really can't tell them apart, and here you tell them apart very well. One of the things about the private sector, though, is that it's only private as long as a patent is viable and all patents expire. So the herbicide tolerant soybean, this time next year, it's off patent. It enters the public domain, which means people can you know, save their seed all over the world, not just in Argentina and Brazil. Um, herbicide tolerance, you know, historically, the, really about the only reason to to justify plowing is to control weeds. Once you have an alternative that's easy to employ, you don't need to plow. Uh, this is again in Central America, and all they did there was punch a hole in the ground, drop a seed in, and then uh, kill the weeds with herbicide, leaving the weeds to protect the, the dead weeds now are protecting the soil. Central America can get some torrential rains. Uh, you know, we can easily get 20, 30 centimeters during a hurricane or in a rainy season. So this is really a big measure towards uh, 
uh, preventing soil erosion from washing away as much. Another one is insecticides. The resistant crops are called Bt crops. And historically, if one had uh, problems, the alternative to, is you spray. And anything that's underneath that spray is out of luck. Doesn't matter if you're a butterfly, a frog, whatever, you're out of luck. And in many areas, you know, farmers just don't use adequate protection. And I've actually uh, spoken to groups of farmers, and I always will ask, how many of you have ever sprayed using inadequate protection? Nobody raises their hand. Then I can ask, well, how many of you know somebody that sprays without using adequate protection? And then the whole room will raise their hand up. But if you look at the World Health Organization data, it, it's about three or four million farmers poison themselves for this reason. And two or three hundred thousand of them die every year for this reason. So it's not just an environmental concern, it's a public health concern. Uh, here's one of the first of the insect tolerant crops was uh, against uh, the bollworm. Uh, here you can see the, the damage it does in the bowl. And you see the uh, engineered version, but at the field level, this is a photograph, again, taken very near where I live. And I think you can tell the engineered half. And uh, when you start seeing photos like this, it becomes very easy to understand why farmers really want that technology. Another problem, corn borers. The North Americans have one, the Latin Americans have one, Africans have one, here in Asia there's a different one. And what these do is they enter the stalk and hollow it out. We call that invisible damage because on the outside it looks okay, but on the inside you're losing yield. And now you're, you're losing yield, the stalk is weakened, and any time the wind blows or it starts to rain, the inevitable happens. And again, you can tell the engineered half and the non-engineered section there. Armyworms, uh, it's particularly in the tropics, they do a lot of damage. And again, here is uh, a, uh, the very nice ones. Uh, you don't see the amount of damage there. And, it be, and here's again an earworm doing what earworms do to an ear of corn. And it's a major issue for for a lot of reasons. One is you lose yield, but number two is the wounds that insects make become infected with fungi. And so here you have a GM ear, a GMO, and you have then the conventional. When our, our smallholder farmers tend to uh, have very low yields to begin with. It's miserable yields, actually, a uh, ton, ton and a half per hectare. But which happens to be the same yields that used to be in England during the Roman Empire. Um, and they, depending on what type of fungus infects it, the fungus can do a lot of toxins. So in areas of China, Africa, Latin America where these toxins exist, we get very high rates of liver cancer and birth defects. And we can have easy ways to control this and we would just be willing to deploy the technology. And they do meet that. They don't have a choice. You know, that when your yields are low, you eat whatever you can. Um, here's some of the experiences again with uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, just a farm, you know, again, very low tech. Here's a farmer and his son showing off his GM cob from his conventional cobs. Again, the fungus problem in the conventional and the non-conventional. Or again, the idea of who, who is impacted by this uh, technology. South African experience uh, has been very much the same. They're getting about 20% yield increase simply by switching the uh, type of corn they plant. It's a brand new product has for Latin America. Uh, it's the insect resistant soybean. And again, when they caterpillars move through, they can really do a lot of damage if they are not sprayed. Uh, the rootworm resistance. You know, plants have roots for a reason. And uh, here's a healthy root system protected by a transgene. Uh, there's one protected by insecticides. And what happens, 
if the root is not protected from damage. And this, you know, if you just think about it, if you have any sort of stress, or say a drought stress or what have you, this root will protect the plant a lot better than that root, and you can see that very well. Uh, the damage insects make really has affected the ability of the plants to grow when uh, there's a lack of water, in this case. Uh, as climates change, one of the predictions is there will be dry, we're going to be drier in many areas. And I know it's hard to believe we're going to be drier given the amount of rain that's out there right now in, in the past few days. But last year, North America had one of the worst droughts ever. And um, if you notice the corn, the those that had access to engineered corn just uh, managed to. Uh, get through the drought in much better condition than those that did not. So that's what the private sector is offering. The public sector has not been left behind. And one of the very first products of the public sector was the GM papaya. This is the, um, the uh, island of Hawaii, and it was their main agricultural export. And the same virus I showed you from Thailand is attacking their papayas here. And it was just a collaborative effort between Cornell University, the University of Hawaii, and the USDA that led to the papaya uh, that really saved the industry on the island. But this is an effort from the government of Brazil that's done entirely in their Ministry of Agriculture. They're the staple crop uh, for the countryside is beans, dry beans. And it also suffers from viruses. And the reason uh, this plant looks healthier is because it was engineered to resist the virus. But what's really impressive is at the time of yield. You can see the difference. So this is what farmers have had to eat, and here's what the government wants them to have to eat. And they are really uh, investing in this as a way to provide more food security in the countryside. Other products, uh, this is uh, between the uh, USAID funded project, a tuber moth uh, resistant potato uh, could be available. Just need to find a country willing to accept it. Uh, projects going on in Africa, the cowpea, the, the pod borer resistant cowpea to prevent that type of damage. Uh, and again, specifically designed for small holders. The, uh, this is a banana plant in uh, uh, East Africa, actually West Africa. Uh, it has the impact of bananas and demonas wilt on it. And here are the field trials in East Africa where uh, you can see how the engineered uh, uh, plant is doing. And by the way, in the, that, those parts of Africa, banana are one of their main staples, one of their main sources of calories. Uh, the Africans also have the Water Efficient Maze for Africa project, uh, where they're putting in conventional breeding for drought tolerance and adding all the transgenes for insect resistance to it. And the hope is to get a uh, 20, 30 percent yield increase in sub Saharan Africa, where the problems are the most serious. There's uh, two or three cassava projects going on with virus resistance. And again, you can see the conventional cassava versus what it could be looking like if you could just eliminate viruses. Uh, this is actually from here. Uh, uh, Dr. Haltia, uh, Haltia gave me uh, this photograph uh, to share. But the reason I'm bringing it in is I think you're all aware of the problems in the, in the Philippines. But there's a similar one going on in Bangladesh. And uh, two days ago, or three days ago now, the Supreme Court of Bangladesh denied Greenpeace request to ban the, the, uh, the eggplant. And it has thus cleared the path to uh, release it to the public. I was, I was uh, in India with uh, people there um, just two days ago. And uh, they're really hoping that by December, it's becoming available uh, to the public. So that's sort of uh, a taste of what uh, is out there. And uh, since the beginning, or at least in the early days of biotechnology, we used to say it was a scale-neutral technology. 
that this large holder here, uh, and he, this guy actually owns everything that you can see in that photograph, was going to benefit as much as the small holder whose holdings fit up front over here. And I think if you flash, uh, fast forward to today, the experience has been otherwise. It's the small holders who have probably benefited or used the technology the most. Earlier I mentioned that there are about 17 million farmers around the world that use GMO technology. About 16 million of those, almost about 90% of those, are classified as small holders, two and a half hectares or less. So why would small holders be investing in this? It's profitable. It, it, it makes life easier for them. Um, overall, there's a firm, there's an accounting firm in London that uh, has kept track of uh, investments in profits in agriculture for many years. And since they started keeping records in 96, they estimate that those farmers who have planted GMO crops have, in, uh, in general, made about $100 billion that they would not have had otherwise. And if you break it out by country, it, the earlier the countries have started using it, and the more they started using it, the more the profits have been. Uh, about, half, about half of those profits are because they have higher yields. And about half of those profits are coming from lower costs. But you know, the U.S. has done so well, uh, you know, almost uh, over $43 uh, billion. And then you know, Argentina, one of the pioneers, is pushing up 14. Uh, China is almost at the same rate. Uh, you know, India is a little bit uh, behind. And then uh, some smaller, you know, Brazil started very late. Uh, but Brazil's catching up fast, and I think it's going to overtake just about everybody. Uh, Philippines, so about 264 million dollars. I think it's just reflecting the size of the corn crop here. Uh, but again, in China, India, Burma, Pakistan, Burkina Faso, South Africa, Paraguay, these are primarily smallholder farmers. So the data for 2011, which is the last one that's out, is that there was some, about a 20 billion dollar farm value that came just from the GMO crops planted. There was more expenses, about five billion were spent on seed. And, but that's the left 14 billion profits up to distribute among those 17 million farmers. And of that, about half went to engineered country, I mean developing countries, half went to industrialized countries. And now, because the use or the, grow, the growth of the GM agriculture is faster in developing countries, this ratio is going to keep on changing uh, towards uh, in favor of developing countries. Here's just some data. I was in Africa a week ago. Um, Burkina Faso, they have uh, 230,000 hectares of cotton, which is about almost 60% of their crop. And those that plant the cotton have about an 18% yield gain. The, uh, they're saving about $52 a hectare by not having to buy as many insecticides. But they're spending more on the seed, $53. So that they're having to spend an extra dollar a hectare to switch from conventional to GM cotton. But then you have to consider this 18% yield gain and higher quality it turns out to about $200 a hectare in extra income. And that's one of the extreme cases. Uh, here's a study out of Germany, uh, just published about a month ago, looking at quality of life in the Indian countryside. The, um, they were looking at uh, food intake, calorie intake, and it was correlated directly with uh, the amount of uh, GM cotton that the farmers were planting. Again, it's all done by hand, you know, again, small farmers. In general, for every hectare of GM cotton they had, the family had about, you know, 50,000 extra calories. And of that, about half was 
what they were calling the quality calories, that they were able to afford to buy the fruits and vegetables that make for a better diet. Uh, economic data, again, here's some uh, of areas more like the Philippines. From, I have not been given any economic data from the Philippines yet. But uh, in Honduras, the bottom line is the, actually this one. For the smallholders, every dollar they put into a GM cot, uh, corn is returning about $5. And it's not always just about the money. I was actually talking with, with some of the farmers there, and there was one that really caught my attention. He had a small holding of uh, corn, and uh, you know he just could not make ends meet. He was not getting enough off his holding to feed the family, so he got, he got a half-time job in the city. Working half-time in the city, he had less time to spend on his farm, so things were just getting worse on the farm until he managed to switch to GM seed, with the, and particularly the herbicide tolerance. His labor requirements on the farm went down so much that then he could still work half-time and get reason, you know, good yield uh, from the farm, have time to spend with his family, and with the extra money, he sent his kids to a uh, private school. So, Colombians have actually done a very in extensive and intensive study of the income. And sort of the bottom line is that, you know, the, the land races are the, have the cheapest seed. Uh, GM hybrids have the most expensive uh, seed. Uh, again, the land races have very low yields, you know, ten, ten and a half per hectare. It, whereas the um, the uh, hybrid, the GM hybrids with a moderate management um, can get six tons per hybrid, and uh, I mean per hectare. Income, the thing to notice with the income is the variability uh, there, but the net bottom line is it's hard to make a consistent profit with land raises. And look how, look, look at the plus or minus here. That as your yields go up and your variability goes down with the conventional hybrids, the, the profits in the, are highest with the GM and the variability, there's more certainty, uh, is greatest with uh, the, uh, the GM as well. So, um, it, it, again, it starts to explain why it's growing so fast, particularly among uh, smallholders. What about environment? A lot of the environmental impacts are talked about in kilos of chemicals, which is a really bad measure. I have an example that I give I, that I can drop a kilo of salt, and you have a kilo of salt in the carpet. I could drop a kilo of cyanide, and the effects would be very, very different. Because kilo for kilo, chemicals are not created equal. So the Cornell University came up with a concept of environmental impact quotient that for every individual chemical, they factor in the impact in wildlife, the how long it stays in the soil, how much of it runs off into the waterways, the impact on the person spraying it, and so forth. And they wrap all that up into one quotient and multiply it by the, the amount used, and you get uh, environmental impact quotient. So this would be just looking at the impact for herbicide tolerant crops. The simple switching there, um, you know, they range from as little as about three, four percent for herbicide tolerant beet to as much as uh, about 25 percent for herbicide tolerant uh, canola just by one switch. And this does not factor in the impacts of the no-till agriculture and, and so forth. Insect resistance is even more spectacular. Uh, you know, what, about 25% less impact in cotton and about 40% less impact for corn production. Easy way. So one of the things we have been doing is setting up demonstration plots. We grow the conventional and the GM side by side and we have field days. And we bring in uh, journalists and we bring in uh, actually regulators, some, every now and then a 
legislator. But you send them out in teams uh, through the both plots and you know, look for diversity. And anything that's been conventionally uh, sprayed, is, you're not going to find much in it. But then you find every, just so many different things in your GM plots where you're not using as much of uh, the traditional pesticides. And we have a lot of data. You know, where I live, it's a big cotton growing area, the birds are back. You know, we're not killing the birds as, uh, with the uh, insecticides as we were before. Uh, they hear data from Australia. This is, happens to be drinking water. The, this is the, their cotton growing area. The white line is what the government considered to be a safe level. And it wasn't until they started planting GM cotton that uh, drinking water truly became safe. But overall, we get back to the original premise. I mentioned that farmers like to harvest yield, not other diseases. Diseases decrease yield. Here's a good example. This is an engineered potato, non-engineered potato. And at harvest time, you can see the, uh, the amount from here and the amount from there. And it's when you start looking at photographs like this that you start to realize how much yield is lost on a global basis. In fact, of the five major crops, which is corn, cotton, soybean, wheat, and potatoes, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of yield is lost every year to pests and diseases. So sometimes simply stopping losses would go a huge way towards meeting our food supply uh, demands now and in the future. And if you look at some of the data on um, the countries that have, uh, this is just yield increases by preventing losses. And you know, with cotton, India has done very well, 40% greater yield, Argentina 30, South Africa about 25. If you look at corn yields, Colombian corn yields increased about 20%, Philippines have increased about 18% and so forth. And if you compare it then with countries like the US and uh, uh, Can uh, say Canada was up here, their increases have not been so high. A, they're in a, less, in a more of a pest-free environment and they had better control measures to begin with. So again, the tougher environments are the ones that tend to get the, the greatest uh, yield gains. Then we also come to a point where we not only do we lose yield from um, pre-harvest, we have post-harvest losses. And that's a big area of growth. In this case, you have two potatoes that were sliced at the same time and apples that were sliced at the same time. And you can see the oxidation that's taking place and making them unappealing. So again, if you can start preventing post-harvest losses, we, again, uh, help contribute towards meeting the necessary food supplies of the future. So, of all the stuff that's out there, it hasn't just, nobody, you know, I haven't made a plant and just shipped it out and planted it. It's gone through two safety assessments, and I could actually give a whole day seminar on environmental safety assessment and I could spend two days on food safety assessment. Suffice it to say that there's a criterion that there will not be any novel risks. You know, agriculture is not risk-free. And agriculture has caused a lot of environmental damage. It has promoted erosion, it's promoted pesticide abuse, and uh, whatnot. So the idea is to not add to the list of damages agriculture does, and if we do things well, we actually remove some of the damage that conventional agriculture has done. So we, don't, we have to ensure there will not be new risks to agriculture, and or that includes wildlife. Many times, you know, if our goal is to kill a corn earworm, we don't want to kill the earthworms and the birds and butterflies and everything else, and we need to make sure there's not going to be gene flow that will cause problems. You know, gene flow has always existed, will always exist. We just need to make sure we're not going to add something that's going to cause a problem. And that's regional in nature. So we, this is done you know, gene by gene, crop by crop, location by location. So whereas this is regional, food safety 
is universal. The criterion is that a food from genetic engineering has to be as safe as conventional food. So if people ask me, can you guarantee it's safe? I can always guarantee that it is as safe as what you're already eating. I can't guarantee that what you're already eating is completely safe, but I can guarantee that it'll be as safe as the GM version. And it's global. Uh, you know, if it's been tested in uh, the European Union or China or wherever, and that they haven't found problems, it's going to be safe around the world. You can maybe um, you can always look at regional differences in, the, in consumption, but in general, it's considered safe. So, in the global market that we have today, where anything that's planted anywhere can end up just about anywhere, the practice is, at least for the major importing countries, that if I have an engineered plant that's going to go out, the major importing countries, actually a lot of countries will, will test the safety, it's a pretty long list, but probably the major importing countries are here, they do their independent testing and they do their independent assessment. So the Chinese Ministry of Ag, Health Canada, the F Food Drug Administration of the U.S., the Food Standards for Australia, uh, Korean FDA, uh, Japanese Food Safety Commission, uh, European Food Safety Agency. The toughest two have been Korean uh, and Japan. But it's only until the major countries have decided it's safe that this reaches the global market. So the point of the matter is there's just a lot of uh, redundancy and multiple layers in the system. The amount of data that uh, is required to meet these requirements, it takes about 34 million US dollars to, to get. And it's excessive. If we're really going to be creating crops for smallholders and whatnot, uh, the number has to come down. I'm convinced with modern technology, we can get this number way down without compromising any safety at all. So there's not been enough studies done. There's been a ton of studies done. Um, there's three websites here, and they have compiled a list of all the refereed literature on GMO food safety testing. And uh, they've been communicating with each other, so they have the same list. But this one's in Australia, this one's in uh, Chile, and this one is in the US. But I think one of the most convincing uh, reports as this was from the European Commission, and anyone can now download the report and read it for themselves. It's called A Decade of European Union Funded uh, GMO Research. And in it, it says that the main conclusion to be drawn from 130 studies, more than 25 years of research, and 500 independent research groups is that biotechnology, and in particular, GMOs are not as such more risky than, say, conventional plant breeding technologies. So they also conclude it's as safe as conventional food. I'm going to specify a little bit about nutritionally enhanced crops. This one is uh, the one being developed in the Philippines. It's the most uh, advanced. Uh, it's golden because of the beta carotene that people need to um, uh, for uh, uh, vision, vitamin A. It, but if you're in Africa, the work is being done in bananas. If you're in South America, it's being done in potatoes. It's portable technology. You can look at a map. This is World Health Organization. And in that map, you know, red means critical. And this dark orange means almost critical. Why, it, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, of all the nutrients, it's the most limiting nutrient in the world, and it's primarily a tropical problem. Now, I can show you guys a map, and, and you know, it's just a map. Or I can show you a photograph what, of what it means to be vitamin A deficient. It's a girl, she's from Bangladesh, she's blind. And she's blind for one reason only, lack of enough vitamin A in her diet. And just like her, there's another half million children 
that are permanently blinded by vitamin A. And it, it doesn't stop there. If you're vitamin A deficient, you're predisposed to a lot of other diseases. And if you're predisposed to other diseases, it ends up an additional 2 million deaths a year. These numbers come from WHO. And we can do something about it. So, with the uh, recent destruction of rice that took place uh, here in the Philippines, you know, the center of development has been here. It attracted global attention as it had never attracted it before. You see, Golden Rice got more positive press out of that one act of vandalism than it had up until now. And it started out with this uh, petition that in less than 24 hours had gotten over a thousand signatures from the most prominent plant scientists around. And it just took 48 hours to come up to 4,000 signatures. And it's still there at 6,000 signatures. At this point, there's not a whole lot more plant scientists left on Earth that can still sign it. And um, it you know, even gave an editorial in the New York Times. And uh, you know, normally, they get very negative press, or if they pay attention at all. And then in the last week of the issue of science, the editorial, Standing Up for GMOs, uh, was written by the most prominent plant scientists around to include two Nobel laureates. So the global spotlight is now on the Philippines to see what's going to happen uh, with the golden rice here. And uh, you can expect a lot more publicity uh, on it. So to finish off, my take home message is, genetic modification is not new. We've been doing it for really thousands of years. We just didn't know what we were doing uh, back then. As far as traits go, uh, you know, there's uh, the soybean being made. Here's the list. Right now we're working on, uh, we have drought, disease tolerance, insects, herbicides, nutritional enrichment. And you know, as time goes on, we hope to have a lot more there. But it's, technology has been too popular with farmers. It's here to stay. We can't get rid of it at this point. So it has to be looked at as part of a solution to meet the challenges. We have climate change coming on. We have population that's going to keep on. We have you know, a couple more billion people are going to be added to the problem. We're better off if we consider it part of a way to solve a problem, not a problem to be solved. Safety. Of all the problems that people were afraid of 20 years ago, 17 years later, with you know, the, white, you know, the billion hectares, 30 countries, 17 million farmers, they simply have not materialized. You know, there, as, as I mentioned, there's extensive safety testing that goes on around the world. They're most studied foods in history. And there's always negative claims. And there will always be negative claims. But what we're waiting for is a negative claim that somebody can actually confirm. Right now, none of the negative claims have had uh, credibility, have been credible for a variety of reasons. So we can really say that they are as safe as uh, conventional food. However, as I said at the beginning, distribution is still limited. Most countries, have people there have never seen a GMO crop. They've only seen what's on the internet. They don't know what a GMO crop really is. And in a background like that one, it's very easy for misinformation to circulate. And our challenge is dealing with that misinformation for the time to come. So with that, a picture from uh, my home country. And uh, wanted to uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Parrot, for your for a lot of information that you've shared with us today. So, from all the commercialized uh, products developed by the private, and all those in the pipeline coming from both public and private, you also shared with us information about economic impact, environmental impact, and all those challenges. Not only for the scientists, he said that GMO are here to stay. 
is it really true for the Philippines, for instance? Our GMOs are really here to stay? So with that, uh, the floor is now open for uh, questions, comments, or reactions from you. So who would like to uh, give the first question? Kindly introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Sir, we have a microphone. My name is Ben Taisa. You mentioned that uh, there's no confirmation of negative impacts. About Unique to GMOs. Yes, it's you. Uh, about a couple of years ago, we had a guy from France, Seralini, who spoke here. And he said that uh, he had some feeding uh, experiments with rats, mm -hmm. and they created cancer. Uh, there were some people in the audience. Jenny was there also. Could you comment on those? I would records? love to comment on that. <laughs> and so, uh, thank you for uh, bringing it up. Uh, Sarah Laney has been a strong anti-GMO opponent for about 15 years now. He has abused statistics and science in so many ways. That one study that he published which has been discredited by pretty much all the regulatory agencies in the world, I can, I'll be glad to give you all the references, was so full of errors, it's not funny. It was deliberately done to deceive us. To begin with, he used the spray of rats, does he use spray dolly rats, that naturally, you know, if you fed them organic food and gave them holy water to drink, they're still going to get tumors. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at historical data with them, somewhere between 80 and 100 percent of sprayed dolly rats get tumors before they're two years old. Number one. Number two, um, the way he designed the experiment that did not follow any of the international guidelines, uh, and he had a control group of 10 rats and treatment root, uh, groups of 90 rats. I'll take rats out of the picture for a moment. Suppose that you had 10 people here and 90 people there. Where are the odds that some, in somebody, you know, which group is most likely to have somebody get ill or die first? Group of 90, group of 10. So that's a gross distortion of statistics. Uh, another one is there's still, we know some of the major details that he released, like, you know, uh, were, which were against guidelines, like giving them unlimited amounts to eat and whatnot. There's a lot of details that have yet to be released. The raw data have not been released. Australia, Food Standards Australia has requested it. Uh, EFSA, European Food Safety Agency, has requested it. And he has refused to um, release it. And furthermore, uh, earlier, when I think at the beginning, someone asked who, who's the scientist in the room, who was that? Raise your hands a second. Okay. Scientists. Okay, I want to ask you guys. Have you ever had a film crew in your lab filming your experiment from start to finish for two years? He had a film crew there since day one to film that particular experiment, and you can go buy the movie, it's called Rural Guinea Pigs, or you can buy the book. It was a, and anyway, the list just goes on, and I'll be glad to give you links of where to find more information on it, but as I say, every major scientific organization and regulatory agency has discredited it, and it is uh, just really, um, I think, as the ultimate in um, deception that he has sprung. And it, but it's effective communication technique. You know, ethical, if you look at the European guidelines for ethical treatment of animals, any rat that gets a tumor is supposed to be euthanized when it's uh, t uh, two centimeters in size. And he broke the ethical rules to get large, impressive tumors on the rats. I mean, it just goes, you know, <laughs> it, it, it just, I don't think there had ever been a study that had so many issues in one spot. Okay. Yes, sir. Can the introduce yourself? Uh, 
Well, hello. My name is Pia from Rappler. Uh, I'm from Online News. Um, I also read reports somewhere that, uh, in Cornell actually, a Cornell study, that um, a kind of uh, GM corn, I think it was Roundup, um, kills non-target organisms, for example, modern butterflies and ladybugs. What is your response to that? Glyphosate doesn't kill non-target insects. There was a report, one, again, one of the very first and bad reports in GM was that BT corn killed monarch butterflies and other insects. Uh, none of the corn BTs kill ladybugs, by the way, because it's a, they're coleopterans, uh, so it's a different type of insect. The original corn report, the guy, what the guy did is he went over and put a paper bag on the tassel and shook. Then he added scoopfuls of pollen and let the caterpillars eat and die. A lot of us were surprised by the results because the particular corn that he used did not express Bt in the pollen. And later it turned out that when uh, he shook the tassel, he didn't separate the pollen from the, from the tissue that happens when you shake tassels. So what he was actually feeding the caterpillars was, um, was uh, bits of tissue, pulverized tissue, rather than pollen itself. But even if you assume that the pollen was toxic, you know, what you do in the environmental risk assessment is if you have a potential insect that can be damaged, is pollen present at the same time the insects are there? And it turns out that over the range of the monarch butterfly, there's only a little part in northern Michigan where the pollen shed and the insect presence overlap. Now, there have also been reports, though, of glyphosate affecting mild, uh, soil microorganisms, uh, particularly bacteria. And in fact, if uh, you spray Roundup on soybean, for example, it shows what we call a yellow flash, where the Roundup in, uh, inactivates the bacteria that fix nitrogen in the nodule. And it will last two or three days. But at the end of the season, the yield is back up which means that any inhibition was very temporary at best. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Wayne, you, you mentioned that uh, the Philippines is at the, at really the center of the, the debate now on biotech. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and perhaps related to uh, the golden rice and the, and the, uh, the BT eggplant and how those are, are not products of Monsanto. Thank you. Those are not products of Monsanto, what can you say? Um, you know, somebody to argue against something like golden rice, it's a difficult to sit, you know, how can you possibly argue against children going blind? It's a tough position to hold. So if one monitors the uh, anti-GMO websites and chatter and tweets and whatnot, there's a clear perception that they feel that if golden rice is approved, it's going to be very hard to stop technology in other parts of the country of the world. So the anti-GMO lobby is really looking at golden rice as the last barrier between widespread use of the technology and keeping it reserved. So as golden rice gets closer to approval, you can expect that every last attempt will be made to stop it. Be ready. That's why communication is going to be so important. Yes. Uh, there's another argument that the money spent on research for golden rice, if you put it all together, it could have been spent to feed uh, children with vitamin A deficiency, or why do we have to spend so much for this kind of technology when we can simply feed them food which is already naturally enriched with vitamin A? Uh, what, what would you then say? Well, the first thing I would say, uh, again, it, it, it's, a, it's a fair question, a very fair question, but the first thing I'll say is that feeding them natural food has led to that map I showed you, where it's highly 
the, uh, it, you know, we have that band around the tropics where it's a problem. It is associated with poverty, no doubt about it. But, you know, the sources tend to be uh, vegetables and fruits. You know, the, the mangoes you have here, the papayas, it's the same color as in golden rice for the same reason. But you can't store mangoes and papayas in a way, or leafy vegetables. You can't store them and have them cheaply available over long periods of time. And there's the issue of bioavailability. The golden rice carotene is one of the most bioavailable ones we have. Uh, it's something like three uh, beta carotenes will give you one molecule of vitamin A. And once you get to the other things, you have to eat a lot more of them to get the same level of vitamin A in your diet. So it is, I, I still think it's a, primarily a disease of poverty and it will help itself once general poverty levels are relieved. But until then, we have to do something. Getting vitamin A out to every person every year in different parts of the world is not easy. You know, and the Philippines actually has a lot more infrastructure than a lot of other part, uh, parts do. So. A false choice. There's that wonderful old saying: if you if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. And and sur surely there's no more uh, noble investment for for the public to make than in in uh, in something that will permanently raise the uh, the nutritional levels of, of everyone. If you take that money, it's there for now, but this is an investment in, in research. And if you could, uh, Wayne, comment maybe on or, uh, the it, it, environmental impact of organic as opposed to biotech. Yeah. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind is what we all want is sustainable agriculture. Particularly, as their population goes from the current 7 billion towards 9, 10 billion, there's not a lot more land area available. Fresh water is going to be in short supply. We really don't want to be using more pesticides inputs. We really need to get more per uh, unit area that we have. And we have to do it sustainably without degrading the land the way we've degraded it in the past. And it is the goal of both organic and um, biotech to uh, you know, reduce the, the footprint of agriculture. Now, as far as organic, uh, again, you know, they don't use some, they largely, not totally, but largely avoid synthetic chemicals. You never get something for nothing in agriculture. And the trade-off in the case of organic is a lot more labor and usually have lower yields. Nobody in the organic industry has yet ex explained to me where all the nitrogen is going to come from. The world situation in nitrogen is that um, about two people out of every five, the nitrogen in our bodies was not fixed in nature. It came out of a factory. The global nitrogen fixation rate cannot just maintain the current human population. And the organic industry has yet to figure out where this gap in nitrogen is going to come from. Uh, so until that's solved, we could not switch over to organic tomorrow. But uh, the other issue then is cost. As, as labor is higher. So it, it, you know, we could all go organic, assuming they solve the nitrogen impact. But was, are we really willing to pay higher food prices? So it's going to, I think it's going to be a niche market for wealthy people who can afford it. And I think it, we should never think of organic and biotech as mutually exclusive, because they're not. They're just two approaches for the same goal. And I just think that if you look at the data, the data support that biotechnology is simply a more efficient, economical way to achieve the same goals. Yes, sir. 
Kim from GMA News Online. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, health-wise, what's the risk of, uh, how much is the risk with, um, with uh, genetically modified um, crops? Because uh, I mean, we were talking about a, while, a while ago about Greenpeace saying that we can't really tell um, what uh, the long-term effects of these uh, GMOs because I mean, the, the time frame isn't done yet. We, c we can't really see it now, we can see it in the future. So how much uh, risk could we possibly, uh, are we possibly facing? I was hoping somebody would ask me that question. So thanks uh, for doing that. Uh, the short answer is you're facing the exact same risk as the non-GMO food. Greenpeace is the most morally corrupt NGO, multinational NGO this earth has right now, period. And they know the answer very well, but they just don't say it. Uh, safety assessment is not based simply on uh, feeding trials. That's just one of the very many tests that are done. So when we do a GMO, you have a change you want to make and the change that might happen by accident. The change you make is a gene you add, the protein it makes, you know, an insect resistant protein or whatever. So the first thing you do is you do, uh, you isolate the changes, the intentional changes and test them for safety. Uh, they cannot be toxic, they cannot be allergens. And furthermore, and by the way, proteins do not cause cancer, which is another little detail. Uh, one of the criteria is that the protein that's made has to be totally digested in your stomach. 90, I'm sorry, it's 90% digested within two minutes. That's a codex uh, standard. So the premise is that you don't have things leaving your stomach that are going to bioaccumulate in your body uh, and come back and hurt you long term. And then within the we also look for things that might have changed that we didn't notice. And a lot of the expense of the safety testing comes from what we call compositional analysis. You tear the plants, the crops apart, and you look at, every, at the levels of everything in there. And if something has changed, it would be a red flag that something else might have changed. So to be approved, the compounds have to be identical. There cannot be any changes allowed. So at the end of the day, if two things are exactly identical, you can't say one is safe and one of them is unsafe. For you to, you know, for you to say one is unsafe, there physically has to be something else added to it. Sorry, I just want to clarify something about um, uh, golden rice. Also, um, I, 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 I hope I remember my science correctly, but um, one of the arguments of the um, anti-GMO camps is that um, the, in order to, to digest, uh, to convert beta-carotene into vitamin A, you need, uh, the body needs a certain amount of protein. Is that true? And, um, and if, I, I think it, they say that the uh, golden rice isn't uh, the best alternative because you need, you need to eat a lot order to, uh, to, to convert the, the carotene to vitamin D. Yeah, they say a lot of things, don't they? <laughs> okay, so, you know, uh, but the way this has gone, it, actually you need uh, fat, it's a fat-soluble vitamin if you don't have a lot of fat in your body. So that was one of the charges that were made earlier on, that, you know, you it wasn't going to be absorbable and not there wasn't going to be enough and everything else. There were actually feeding trials done in the United States on it. And some of the NGOs from uh, Europe accused the people carrying on the trials of uh, committing Nazi war crimes. But what the results did show is that it was highly absorbable and that you just need about 50 grams, you know, a handful a day to prevent all the worst symptoms. Then the Greenpeace came back with the argument that, yeah, that was in the United States where they're well-fed, but you know they're not the target population, and so forth. 
So there was a second set of trials that was conducted in China. They have been rather controversial as well. Uh, and again, using children of the target audience, although the test was controversial and Greenpeace got a lot of press out of it, what's not controversial are the results. And the, re and the results are very clear that in the target population, there will be no, um, you know, they absorb it, and say that's, you know, three, the, three beta carotenes to one, and that's where the highest absorption rates ever measured. And they need about 50 grams a day uh, to, to keep off the worst symptoms. And if and when uh, this is approved, there's a lot of follow-up uh, studies that are planned. Uh, the Helen Keller uh, Foundation for the Blind has uh, said, you know, they're going to do monitoring at the population level in, in target areas to make sure that you know, in the real world it's having an impact as well. Great. Another question <laughs> uh, about the BP talong, naman. and uh, I think one of the fears of uh, here in the country is field testing. They say that it, that um, you know through pollination or something like that, uh, you, these uh, genetically modified crops might quote unquote in, infect the um, other non-genetically modified uh, crops. Uh, what do you say to this? You know, we have, one of the things that we do, in the, at least in the U.S., uh, or actually in our field environmental risk assessment field guide, the best measure that you have is if, you, if there has been gene flow between a conventional uh, variety and its wild relatives, and you put in a GMO, it's going to flow just as much, not more, not less. If the, you've been able to have uh, no gene flow or very, you know, too, too little gene flow to make a difference between the conventional and wherever you're trying to protect, then why should the GMO behave differently? So the um, so biologically, you know, one of, one of the, I guess one of the things that really annoys me a lot is they say, oh, if you do this here, oh, this is going to happen over here. But they never tell you the series of events or the biology that, that has to link one with the other for the events to cross. So the other thing, uh, so, you know, the biology is not always there. And that's one of the things that you have to look at during the uh, risk assessment. It's one of the reasons we have field trials. And that's one of the reasons it's unconscionable to rip out a field trial. Um, so, again, we assess the gene flow possibility case by case. You know, every, every gene in every crop in every location to see if that could happen. And I also want to remind people that pollen flow and gene flow are very different things. Uh, the one that would cause a concern is gene flow. Uh, and a lot of things have to happen for pollen flow to become uh, gene flow. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Violi Villegas, I used to work in the university, but I crossed the fence <laughs> and I'm with the private sector. Just a compliment on what Dr. Parrot said on, on the question on safety. The young lady in front said there's no long-term long study. But you see, the food that we eat, the crop that we take in, they have a long history of safe use. How many hundred years have we, have we been eating rice? So if the scientists have established equivalence, then they are, they, that's why Dr. Parra said, they are as safe as. If we wait for 500 years before a technology gets commercialized, where do you think we will be? Another point, sometimes communicating biotechnology takes a lot of, it's an art, it's a skill. Many misinformation, disinformation, and bad news make, Make, uh, they sell. 
For example, papaya has always been my first love. We have virus, the ring spot virus. If you eat uh, GM papaya with a minuscule DNA from the virus, that's it. You eat a small portion, you digest it together with the food that you eat. But if you eat a papaya infected with a virus, you take in millions, if not billions, of whole viral genome. Have you ever heard of anybody dying of eating papaya here in Philippines? So it, it's, it's communicating and understanding what the technology is. That's very well said. Thank you for those comments. Yes. In the back and then up front. Okay. I'm Desiree Heltea. I'm uh, from the University of the Philippines and I am involved in the VDF Plan project. I would just like to make a comment on the question earlier posed on BT uh, eggplant field testing. Uh, so that was the particular question. But I would like to frame it in the whole, in the area of uh, the requirement for field testing. Uh, as Dr. Parrott uh, um, indicated in this presentation, environmental safety is a must before any GM crop is going to be put into the into the market. So how do you do environmental testing if you don't put it in the environment? And that's the reason why field testing is part of the whole safety assessment process. Now, Greenpeace says that you cannot do field testing uh, safely. Well, maybe they don't, but we do. And that is a standard uh, safe, uh, there, a standard uh, practice uh, which has been great part of the regulatory process by all countries in the world and even agreed upon under the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. So, and the Philippines follow the rules. And we have a system that has been put in place for the last 12 years which have undergone so many field testing with no any proof or evidence that it has harmed the environment or the Filipino people. Now, beyond the Philippines, you can look at the website in terms of how many thousands of field trials are conducted, are being conducted in the whole world. And again, no verifiable and evidence that it has harmed environmental safety environment or the human health. Otherwise, if there is something that has been harmed, for sure it will land in the uh, top page of Google and any other, uh, any other publication in the whole world. And it will be posted by Greenpeace, even if it is not still written in the press. So again, uh, the question of field testing, the safety of field testing, is, uh, is an established protocol. Now, the safety of BT alone is another question. And that is the one that we are trying, we have been building evidence in addition to the evidence already presented and already approved by the regulatory body of India. So, the, 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 for the information of everyone, the gene, that has been put in BT eggplant is the same gene that has been put in BT cotton that has been approved by EFSA and all the, um, uh, uh, and all the uh, regulatory agencies that was put in one of the slides of Dr. Parra. And it has been proven to be safe. The Philipp uh, so, uh, BT, uh, the Cry1AC, which is the gene present in BT eggplant, is the same family as the one in BT corn, which we have been eating. And please don't tell me that it is the corn in the Philippines is only for feed. Now, if you are still not convinced that this BT, uh, this BT gene 
is not harmful. How many of you eat eggplant that is raw? Remember that BT cry one ac is a protein. If you heard Dr. Uh, uh, Para, there are no uh, proteins don't cause cancer. If you know your basic uh, nutrition, you know that if you eat protein, it's degraded into amino acid. If you cook protein, it's you can never you you will, you will even destroy it. So, what are we testing long term if it is not there? So that's my uh, response to the lady for both the field testing and the safety of the tech plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those comments. And if I can just uh, follow up, one of the things that happens with Greenpeace is it sets up a, a false dichotomy. EPA in the United States has a risk benefit assessment, whereas Cartagena really doesn't permit that. It's either no risk or you do what you're doing. What is the risk of all the pesticides, I mean the known measurable risk of using current practices with all the insecticides? Who is it that dips the plants in them? In them? How many of them wait the required 30 days before they're sold to the public? That is a real risk and we're continuing it because we're not willing, because Greenpeace is not willing to accept this hypothetical risk that's not materializing anywhere. enjoying uh, just listening uh, to everyone <coughs> but I just want to add uh, just a little bit of, uh, <coughs> of uh, point of view because I really wonder why there is so much uh, <coughs> talk against uh, GMOs <coughs> particularly testing of GMOs they are being tested and I would like to think that uh, antibiotics, particularly vaccines, uh, they come from, from uh, mic microbes. Huh? They are even injected into our body. And we don't say that's bad. It could, it could uh, be bad for the health of man. Uh, of course, there are uh, those uh, antibiotics that are rejected because they have to be to undergo a very rigid uh, test. Not everything, not all antibiotics, not all vaccines could pass the rigid test. In the same way, here in GMO, we are not saying all GMOs are good. We are saying BD is good because it has done, uh, uh, undergone a lot of testing. So, uh, why prevent the scientists from making field testing? This is part of a uh, scientific process to find out whether it's safe or not. So I really wonder why Greenpeace is destroying field tests of a BT egg club. <coughs> I, I think uh, let the scientists uh, do their job. They know what, is, what are they doing and uh, they are not going to, to release something that will be harmful to the environment or to the health of the people. Thank you. Wonderful comments. Uh, two follow-ups to it. One is, at the very early days of the technology, I remember the Institute for Food Technology in the United States sponsored a series of information sessions for all the top chefs. And I had to do one. And one of the chefs stood up and she said, in my brain, everything you say makes sense. But when it comes to food, food is an emotional topic. You know, we don't think rationally when it comes to food. And she's completely right. So Greenpeace is a multinational NGO that sells fear. And what better commodity to sell fear on than something as emotional as food. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
one of the comments I have was already uh, mentioned that uh, I was asked really if we should not, if, if, they said you should not be rushing in the case of BT, BT eggplant because we do not know the long term effect and it is primarily used for food. But I said you have to be practical, compare it with the present practice. And what is the present practice? You dip the fruit in the pesticide, the eggplant fruit. Yes, the farmers, the, some farmers do that. And so I said, what if there are already some holes or some feeding portions when the insect have fed? Then what will happen? That is definitely more dangerous. Okay. And then uh, the, another question which I can never forget was for the BT corn. I was one of the three scientists who had to face uh, those uh, who were against the green face and others. And one of the, the last questions I was asked by a nun was, Mrs. Bernardo, should scientists not feel concerned that you are playing God? I said, why do you say we are playing God? I said, because the genes are in the microbes, and then the scientists transfer them from the microbe to the corn. So you are playing God. I said, well, sister, I'm not as religious as you are. But I believe that nothing will succeed without the permission of God. And the fact that God gave us the wisdom, the knowledge, and we succeeded in doing it, to me, that is already a permission that God, uh, that, that God has already given us the permission because we, He knows that this is safer for all of us than the present practice. And that is the, our discussion during that Senate hearing. I've got to follow up on that, you know, because what you said is exactly what the Catholic Church has officially said. Exactly that. Um, I think it was the first one to come up with this idea that we we're playing God was Prince Charles. And uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Screscia from the uh, Pontificial Academy of, uh, I think, for Social Justice said, no, it is not the view of the Church that we're playing God. In fact, the church has this, it, uh, compiled its social doctrine. It's called the Social Doctrine of the Church. And it is online. And I invite you to read chapter 10, section 4, where it says exactly what Dr. Bernardo said. And on top of that, there is the Pontifical Academy of Sciences statement, the Vatican statement on GMOs, that repeats the same thing. God gave you the ability, the, the brains, and the intelligence, and the technology, so you can go out and help the others. And it goes on to say that if you're a scientist, you probably have a greater duty to use your talents to help your fellow man. So, and the, one of the things, though, about the pontificial, I mean, about the social doctrine, where it talks about the role of biotechnology and the responsibility of the scientists, it also talks about the responsibility of the government and the responsibility of the media. And it specifically calls on the media to be accurate in their reporting. So thank you so much for having brought that one up. Okay. So do we still have any question? Maybe we, maybe we can have just this last question. Okay. Yes. Last question. I have three questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So first of all, uh, about the on the concern that um, these kinds of the GM will infect other native crops. Um, there's the other camp is saying that once you plant, for example, GM rice, then wind comes or other pollinators and they spread the seed in the in the crops of uh, farmers who choose organic agriculture, for example. Uh, what happens then? I mean, that's that's where they're they're coming from. That. Once you put this in nature, you can't call it back. That's why they're citing environmental concern and precautionary principle. Because um, if there are no proven but plausible claims, mm -hmm. then the government or the government has the mandate to protect the public from it, even if there aren't proven. But if there are plausible threats, then you can call on the precautionary principle. That's my first question. Those are that's actually a really good set of questions. Yes, I I, I personally believe that once it's out there, it's out there. You know, you're not going to call it. And, that, and as a matter of fact, when we do our environmental assessments uh, in Latin America, we start with that premise that once it's out there, it's out there. 
So one of the things to keep in mind with organic farmers is organic farmers have never ever, except in Europe, had the ability to tell their neighbors to stop using synthetic pesticides. And yet, when a neighbor of an organic farmer uses synthetic pesticides, they're going to drift onto the organic farm. So historically, ever since organic agriculture started, and then World War II when we started using chemicals, organic farmers around the world have had to take measures to stop chemicals from the neighbors going on into their farms. Now, they cannot stop at 100%. So if you look at the organic standards, for example, go on the iPhone website or something, there's thresholds set. And in fact, the definition of, uh, of organic bans not the presence of synthetic chemicals, it bans the intentional use of unapproved synthetic chemicals. Because they have, there, are some, there are synthetics that are approved for organic. You know, organic is not pesticide free by any stretch of the imagination. But anyway, the point of the matter is it has always been incumbent upon organic farmers to take precautions to keep drift off their fields. And, along this, and those very same precautions uh, stop pollen drift as well. Rice in general doesn't have a lot of pollen drift uh, compared to something like, say, sorghum. The sorghum, uh, we, we would have to uh, have issues there when we discuss uh, sorghum. The rice in general doesn't have a lot of uh, pollen flow issues, which is why making hybrid rice commercially is so tough. Is because how do you get you know move the pollen flow to the extent possible? But in general, as long as they're taking precautions to stop chemical drift, those same precautions uh, tend to uh, stop pollen flow as well. Uh, in the U.S., one way in which they coexist is neighbors talk with each other and they'll stagger planting, you know, not plant at the same day, or plant varieties and flower at different times. And if you take, and so as long as you have those measures in a threshold, you're not going to have any problems. What we do have are some farmers that do not want, you know, who still have the synthetic residues, but they want zero percent tolerance for GMOs. And once we get to zero percent, that's no longer coexistence. That's non-existence. So um, as long as there's thresholds and, and the historical measures, things have worked very well. They stop working when they insist on zero. All right, second question. Um, uh, wait, what was the ah, on labeling, GMO mm -hmm. labeling, because it's also another debate. So. Um, the other camp is saying that if this technology is so brilliant, is so new, is so wonderful, then why not label GM products? And then some people say that you can't. Oh man, that, that's a long... How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let me just start with what Codex says. First of all, remember, GMO is a process. It's not a product, right? So, the way that Codex Elementarius talks about it, if this process adds, you know, changes the product. You do label it, and that's around the world. Something like golden rice in the, uh, would be labeled as, you know, high carotene rice because it's different from uh, the conventional counterpart. But as long as there's no difference at all, what are you going to label? For example, there is not a single laboratory on the planet that can differentiate between oil from a GMO soybean and oil from a conventional soybean. So how are you even going to verify the labels if there is absolutely no difference between the two of them? And then the very same people that are insisting on labeling GMO, you know, they, they're fine when labels say spices, extracts. Why not label those? You know, uh, so the problem with uh, the process-based, when you go into a process-based label, is where you uh, use the line. You want a label if GMO is used in the process. She wants a label if it was done with uh, renewable gas versus fossil fuel gas. They want a label if it was uh, harvested by widows and orphans or if it was harvested by uh, immigrants from another country. Where do you draw the line? And the final issue is when does something become a GMO? 
let's say you have a can of uh, corn, you know, if, if 95 of the grains out of 100 are organic, you're allowed to call the whole can organic. But it takes, you know, if you have 94 grains in a can of 100, you can't call it organic anymore. So the people that want labeling, though, one grain out of 100 makes a whole 100 GMO. Where is the logic in that? And that's, that's in Europe. You go to Japan, they'll, they'll let you have five grains before you have to label it. Brazil lets you have four. Because there is no scientific criterion to use, you get all this arbitrary issues there. And at the end of the day, because labels have to be verified for, to meet international commerce, all, the only thing you're really accomplishing is you're raising the price of food. Because you have to pay for the labeling infrastructure. Okay, third question, sir. Because um, we have an uh, agriculture, organic agriculture app. It's a law. It's a republic app. And in that app, it says that GMOs aren't part of the framework which farmers should be using in the Philippines. And so some would say that uh, GM testing in the Philippines is actually illegal. Uh, and even if we have other, um, you know, administrative acts, they all obviously fall under or should, should be superseded by uh, a constitutional law, like a republic act. So uh, what would you then say to that? I'm not sure I understood the Filipino law. Organic Agriculture Act. Uh, I just forget the year, but it's online. I quoted it in my other article. Um, and it says there that it's a kind of framework that says organic, organic agriculture is the preferred um, you know, uh, mode of agriculture in the Philippines. It's something which should be promoted. The government should be promoting it. And we all know that GM testing here is supported by government agencies. So it, the, the other camp is saying that it's quite contradictory when you have you know, the national government saying the government shouldn't promote anything but organic agriculture. Then we have departments under the government promoting what they say is not organic. Yeah, that's not a uniquely Filipino issue. It, it happens in other parts. It, you know, at the end of the day, science moves much faster than uh, policy and regulations do. And if it's an international regulation, it's going to move even much more slowly. Uh, in that, you know, European Union. Uh, has a similar policy and they're really pushing it in the United Nations. What has it done for the European Union? Do you know that it takes uh, land the size of Germany to plant all the food that Europe is no longer producing because of that? So it, it's, it's a bad policy and it's unfortunate but I think sooner or later there's going to be a reality check uh, in the, uh, not just here, but it's going to be around the world. There's a, a comment there. On organic agriculture, true, there's an organic act, but it doesn't say it is the only option that the Philippines has to take. It is one option. There are many options. As like like GM is an option. GM is not will not solve all our problems, but it is an option that we can take. Organic, you can grow organic. Nobody bars you from going organic. There are many options. In, in, in overcoming our agricultural problems. Maybe, maybe organic can feed the Filipinos if there are only 30 million Filipinos. There were 30 million Filipinos when I was in the sixth grade. We're now 100. So these are options. And the role of the government agencies is, are to see to it that these options are safe to use. Uh, One last comment. I, I, I remember some, the, the young lady in front mentioned about pollen flow, gene flow. Let us not romanticize it. Gene flow, pollen flow is part of our evolutionary process. If you saw the, the, the wild relatives before they became the edible types that we have today, that's a product of gene flow. That's a product of selection which our forefathers made thousands of years ago. We just tried to speed it up. Very well said. Okay, so at this point, uh, we'd like to give a round of applause to all of us. Very good discussion. 
Uh, may I invite uh, uh, Circa uh, man, uh, KMD uh, head, uh, Dr. Sel Cadiz, to give a token of appreciation and certificate for uh, Dr. Wayne Parrott.